Hey everybody, it's Flark, and uh, I heard your request loud and clear, okay? This is a pre-patch survival guide that's going to bridge the gap between just coming back to the game and going into Dragonflight. We're talking questions like, what the heck is my rotation? How do I do a burst window? How do I do obscene opening pressure like you do? Um, where do I even get PvP gear so I can test all this stuff out? Like, what am I supposed to be doing right now to play these characters? Because all you gave me were some talents, but I think I got to know how to play them as well. And I heard you. I'm with you. So I'm going to add those to all of my Dragonflight guides for the for the rest of my time making content on YouTube. But I'm also gonna do a little bit of a synopsis of it right here, right now, so you guys can be ready for getting into Dragonflight just like the rest of us, okay? So if you're a beginner into PvP, or you're just trying to get familiarized with all the new concepts, the new abilities, the new cooldowns, the new defensives, all this stuff, this is a guide for you. Timestamps for everything will be below. I encourage you to use them because this is gonna be Frost and Unholy to get you familiarized with all DPS DK because I think they're both gonna be very, very good going into Dragonflight. So enough talk. Please use the timestamps. Everything should be organized well and have a blast. Okay, so we're going to start things off with a real quick briefing on how to gear before Dragonflight. Of course, a lot of people, if you start off, you're going to be getting destroyed in PvP. So I'm going to try and help that eventually be not the case. You got about three weeks to get this gear to just practice and experiment around. So I might as well show you how to do it. Of course, if you're just coming back, you get the uh, conquest gear from this guy right here. So let's look at the map real quick so you can see where I am. This is the enclave right next to the word enclave right at the top of this little section here. And that's where everybody is. So this guy in the middle, Zosorg, has conquest gear, which means you need conquest to buy it, but it's gonna be unranked. So instead of buying honor gear, you're gonna save your honor because when you get to a certain rating, you can upgrade that conquest gear on this guy right next to him, Zodash. You put a piece in there and you can upgrade it right here. Now, this is not how it's going to work in Dragonflight, but we're not in Dragonflight right now. Like I said, three weeks to go. So that's the setup you're going to do. You're going to use Conquest to buy pieces and Honor to upgrade it. You're not going to really buy any Honor pieces right now because then you won't have any Honor to upgrade your gear. How do you get Conquest? Easy. Any PvP, right? Solo Shuffle works very well. 200 conquest, 600 honor. You can get a daily twos win, a daily threes win. A rated battleground win gives a ton, but solo shuffle really gives a lot. So you could just spam this. Hopefully you don't get too many levers. I know that's been a problem. And uh, with that with that currency, you're just gonna save it up and you're gonna go to these people, buy it uh, and upgrade it. To upgrade it, you just need to get to rating thresholds, 1,000, 1,200. 1400, 1600. It's all grayed out, but it doesn't matter. They fixed it. So you can actually get rating right now in any of these brackets and use it to upgrade your gear. So if you want to bang your head into twos as much as you can, rated 2v2s, just do that. And once this number goes higher, you will be able to upgrade your gear. Um, so yeah, that's gearing in a nutshell. But what you guys are really here for are rotations and playing defensive and comps and all that. So let's get right into it. Okay, onto the rotation section. We're gonna start with Frost, then go on to Unholy. Timestamps, of course, are below, so if you wanna skip straight to Unholy, that's totally fine. But with the Frost DK rotation, we're gonna talk about Burst and Sustain in this section. Uh, we're gonna start with Burst. Burst is very simple. It's kind of a priority system. You only got three main abilities as Frost, Obliterate, Frost Strike, and Howling Blast, and it's gonna be very easy. You just gotta know the setup. And once you've got it, you're gonna be doing the most damage in the history of the game, right? So Obliteration is key for this Burst window. You can see that I'm running the Obliteration build, all the Obliterate talents, and the Pillar of Frost package. When we get to level 70, we're going to be adding Shattering Blade, Chill Streak, and the Rhyme package, and I'll talk about that as well. But in order to understand your Burst rotation, what you really need to understand is this talent, Obliteration. So let's look at it. Wow, Pillar of Frost is active. Frost Strike and Howling Blast always grant Killing Machine. And that line right there effectively sets up your burst window. That is how you must do your rotation. So in Pillar, you always spam, uh, spend a Killing Machine the second you get it with the next available global. And then the next global after that, you just generate one with either Frost Strike or Howling Blast. How do you pick? If Howling Blast has a Rhyme proc, you use that. If not, you press Frost Strike. So simple. So you're either going Obliterate Frost Strike or Obliterate Howling Blast. Obliterate Frost Strike, Obliterate Howling Blast. You see, I'll alternate back and forth just like that. Um, the only exception to all of this is if your auto attacks generate a killing machine proc 
after you just spent a killing machine. So you didn't need to generate one. Then you just spend it automatically. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like. It's so simple. Again, these three main abilities, Obliterate, Frost Strike, and Howling Blast, you're alternating between them. Obliterate, Frost Strike, Obliterate, Obliterate, Howling Blast, Obliterate. And I'm gonna press Empower Rune Weapon and Pillar of Frost, and I'm not gonna do anything else. And I'm just gonna show you how that mechanic works. So Empower, Pillar, Generate a Killing Machine, Spend it, Rhyme Proc, Killing Machine, Frost Strike, Killing Machine, Frost Strike, Killing Machine, Frost Strike, Killing Machine. You see how simple this was? There you go, another one. Now Rhyme Proc, Killing Machine, All right? Alternate, back and forth. That is your entire rotation. This builds the most strength during Pillar. It gets the best use out of Obliteration. And, well, look at your breakdown. Tons of Obliterate damage, some Frost Strike damage. It will be a ton more uh, once we get Shattering Strikes. Some Rhyme procs in there that are free. So you always have maximum rune generation. You're always spending as many obliterates during that window as you possibly can. And uh, that's your burst window, so simple. But like I promised, we're going to add the rest of the Dragonflight stuff so you know what to look for once Dragonflight comes out. Because eventually, you're going to get what? Shattering Blade, uh, improved Rhyme to make your Rhyme procs deal more damage, and Chill Streak. So what changes? Nothing literally nothing. We were already using Rhyme procs when we generated uh, one to generate a killing machine. Now we still will, but they'll do more damage. Okay, well, what about Frost Strike? You gotta make sure, yeah, when you don't get a Rhyme proc, you spend it on, you use Frost Strike to generate the killing machine, which means you're going to have the five stacks of Razor Eyes built up, which means it's gonna hit insanely hard. Then we're gonna go back to Obliterate, Rhyme proc, Obliterate, and then another Frost Strike's gonna come in and it's gonna have the five stacks of Razor Eyes again. And then that's gonna hit really hard. Nothing changes with the priority rotation, except all of it will be doing more damage. How exciting is that? So the only thing you have to look at is Chill Streak. Well, Chill Streak with Enduring Chill, which makes the bounce, bounce range higher, means really all you're doing is making sure they're stunned and putting Chill Streak in at the beginning of that go. So while you're doing that standard Pillar of Frost rotation, Obliterate, Frost Strike, Obliterate, Rhyme Proc, your Chill Streak will also be bouncing for free for unlimited damage during all of that, right? So the only thing we have to add in is, well, how do we stun them so they're together and Chill Streak does a lot of damage to them? Remorseless Winner stuns players for four seconds once it hits them five times. So what do we add? Grip, blind, remorseless, then do the go. Because you will have Abomination Limb, you have it now from the Necrolord Covenant, you'll have it then from hitting level 70, and you can add more talents. Look at this, add two talents, add one talent. Boom, you're at A-bomb limb. When you blind them and your remorseless goes off, your remorseless starts ticking in the blind. By the time you break it, it's ticked twice. Now the limb comes in, yanks them all in. Three, four, and that stun's gonna go off. That's when you press the chill streak and your pillar of frost rotation is already going. So you're building up that pillar and thus you're building up the strength for your chill streak to hit it harder. And it all comes together at the exact same time. So what would that look like? Grip one training dummy, you can't do that. Grip one target to the other target. Blind them both, remorseless. Now it's building up, three, four, and then right when you actually need it to go off, it's going to go off, right? It stacks way quicker than you expect. Grip, blind, goes to two stacks, start doing your rotation with Abomination's limb, then throw the chill streak right when the stun goes off. All that's going to look like is the regular Pillar of Frost rotation, a grip, blind, remorseless for the stun, and a chill streak once the stun lands. And if you can do all of that, you will do the most damage in the entire game. So let me role play it on this training dummy. Remember, you're going to have a bomb limb. This is the missing a bomb limb spot. I have it right here on E. Um, you're gonna have a bomb limb the second you get to level 70. So you're just adding that as one additional button to that rotation. I'll try and say it all as we go. This again is the maximum output burst rotation. Grip two people together, blind them both. Remorseless Winner, build up that stun. Pillar and Power, start doing it. Obliterate, Frost Strike, Obliterate. Chill Streak, Frost Strike, Obliterate. Rhyme Proc, Obliterate. Frost Strike, Obliterate. Rhyme Proc, Obliterate. If there is any, I mean, yeah, that's it. That's insane damage, right? You got Limp going on during that, pulling them all into a pile, keeping them in that enduring 
enduring uh, chill chill streak to make it even easier to land. While you were doing that nuclear pillar go, the chill streak was bouncing. They were stunned. They all have to trinket. They panic. Unlimited damage. You do it again in 40 seconds uh, with the next chill streak pa uh, pillar and power. And uh, remorseless. And they, look at this. Remorseless 45 second cooldown. Chill streak is a 45 second cooldown. And pillar can be a 45 second cooldown when you lower it with ice cap. And that's your entire frost burst rotation. But thankfully, it's kind of your standard rotation too. Remember, if I went fast or it was all a lot of information to take in, we're in 2022, almost 2023. You're probably watching this on uh, YouTube of where I uploaded it. So you could just go back, play it slower, go back again, play it slower. All the information is there to do the most damage in game. I swear it is that simple. You, there's no extra tricks. But for your sustain rotation as frost, it's the exact same priority. You just don't get the guaranteed killing machine. So now you don't have pillar up, let's say, okay? That's all that burst means. It means you have your main offensive cooldown. So if you don't have pillar, that means you're going into a sustain rotation. Of course, you want to prioritize living. Uh, so death strike is very good. Look at me at 60 runic power. If I was at 70% health, I'd press this, I'd press this button. I would press this button. It heals me. It uses my runic power to do so. But if you're not under any pressure and you don't have to worry about survivability right now, you just use Frost Strike to spend Runic. You just press Howling Blast when you have a Rhyme Proc, and you press Obliterate when you have a Killing Machine. The only difference between the pillar is that every one of those alternate buttons guarantees a Killing Machine. Now, you don't know if you're gonna have a Killing Machine. Furthermore, at some point, you won't have a Rhyme Proc, you won't have any Runic, and you won't have a Killing Machine. Well, what do you have to do? You have to press Obliterate anyway to generate Runic Power. That's just PvE stuff, right? Frost, DK is very, very doable. Of course, the Unholy section will be a little bit more involved, but Frost DK is so doable, and it's a great pickup spec. It's a great starter spec for that exact reason. Once you got that, that, that opening burst rotation, maybe it was a little complex, maybe there was a lot going on, you gotta make sure you set up that blind stun. But once you have that, you're just doing your rotation, your straight PvE rotation on a keyboard. Anything outside of that is going to be the survivability and defensive management that we'll talk about later in the guide. Um, but that's Frost in a nutshell, uh, and that's Frost in Dragonflight. So let's move on to Unholy. So Unholy has a lot more going on, a lot more buttons, a lot more potential builds you could run. Uh, probably too much for one video to go over an exact rotation for each of these builds. So instead, I'm going to establish a priority system with Unholy 2. So let's get it set up. Of course, you always want to remember to put on that two-handed weapon. What do we have here? We have a lot of cooldowns. Some of the cooldowns require synergies with them. Some of them should be used at the same time. Some of them do other things that set up other things. So let's talk about each cooldown and what they do. Raise a bomb. Let's start with him because I add him to a lot of my builds. He's a PvP talent specifically, and this is a PvP guide. So it'd be really good to go over this. Raise a bomb does a lot of things. When you drop him down, you can see he's got a green circle right here. That means this is the area of effect that he's going to be kind of starting in and moving around to. Now, A-Bomb pathing is very bizarre and anybody who plays Unholy can tell you this, but he will go to one of the players nearby this circle. The other thing he will do is pull out everybody in stealth around this circle, even a little bit outside of it, and apply a disease to them. It's an incredible effect. It, uh, it, because of that disease and because of the A-Bomb's reactivation radius, stealthies just come out. Rogues, barrels, mages, and invis. They all just come out of stealth in this area. So you can use him to pull out stealth. But he also applies wounds. He also does damage. He also applies diseases. So what do you want to use A-Bomb for? At the beginning of a fight, put him down, try and pull out a stealthy, and start applying wounds to your main kill target. So that's what's called a pre-pop offensive cooldown, right? Some offensive cooldowns you wouldn't want to press before you even get to the fight. That makes no sense. Right, you wouldn't want to use gargoyle in the starting room, right? Right, you you, you don't want to pre-pop things that you need to start actively engaging with. But a bomb does it by himself. He applies the wounds so you can spend spend them. He does damage so you can lower the health bar, and he pulls out stealthies. Right, so a bomb is a pre-pop. Um, here's uh, dark transform, gargoyle, and apoc. Those are your three like engage 
cooldowns, right? Dark Transform is the first of the th uh, of the three. It could be possibly a pre-pop as well because you press Dark Transform and your pet starts doing more damage. It's not like you need to actively play around that. So as you're running into a fight, like let's say, okay, there's the enemy team and I'm moving in. I already dropped my Ray's A-bomb and now as I'm walking toward him, I press Dark Transformation as another setup global. Then Ray's A-bomb applied some wounds. You Fester Strike once for some wounds and you press Apocalypse. Apocalypse is the first thing you get down once you've connected to the enemy because that's gonna spend all your wounds that you just applied from Raise A-Bomb and Festering Strike, getting those wounds down to zero, starting off your necrotic wounds from this PvP talent right here, right? Getting your Army of the Dead Ghouls out and giving you a ton of runic power from Festering and uh, any other runic power you generated in that time which means you can then go to Gargoyle. And this is what I'm talking about, active cooldowns. You wanna be active when Gargoyle's out because you wanna be on the target, sending your burst and generating runic so you can spend the runic right when it comes in and buff your Gargoyle. That's why you don't wanna use Gargoyle before Dark Transform and Apoc because those abilities, Dark Transform and Apoc, did not spend any runic power. So you're wasting globals that could be used to infuse your Gargoyle. So. Raise Abomination, generate wounds, Dark Transform, set up your pet's damage, one Festering Strike, use your Apocalypse to spend the wounds, get your Runic Power up, then Gargoyle gets the rest of your Runic Power bar full and you just start spamming Death Coil. Once you get fully out of Death Coils, you'll Clawing, and it's kind of a priority system like Frost again, right? So let's say you're about to be capped on Runic. Well, you don't want to waste your Runic Power that you're generating, so you press Death Coil. Well, let's say you have five wounds on the target. You don't want to waste any wounds, so you spend them using Clawing Shadows or Scourge Strike, right? So when you have a lot of wounds, you need to spend them quickly. You, When you have a lot of Runic Power, you need to spend that quickly with Death Coil. But notice something I didn't say, Festering Strike, right? You have a lot of talents, Infected Claws, Raise Abomination, and things that generate a ton of wounds. You don't want a Fester Strike at any point during this burst rotation because you're either going to have a Death Coil you could be spending or a Clawing you could be spending the wounds already on them to put up that Necro Wounds and to burst wounds, which does a lot more damage. Festering Strike is a waste of runes and resources in general because let's say you're at five wounds or four wounds and you spend uh, some runes to get Festering Strike, it puts you at six wounds, and then you get a generated one from A-Bomb and Infected Claws. Well, they can't go any higher than six wounds. So you just completely wasted all those runes, all that global and all the wounds you generated. They're all gone into the nether, right? So with this burst rotation, I have shown you your cooldowns. Raise a bomb, dark transform, one fester, apocalypse, gargoyle down, now start spamming death coils. And I've shown you a little priority system. Okay, your runic is too high, death coil. Your wounds are too high, spend them. Spend, death coil, spend, death coil, spend, death coil. And then nowhere in that do you see pressing fester. That's the biggest mistake I ever see. I ever see DK's mega. Why, why does he have 17 de festering strikes and four scourge strikes, right? They think because it's that two rune button that it's the button you press to do the most damage, but that's not how unholy works. Not in the burst, not even in the sustain is that how unholy works. Fester is only an option for when you have no runes, wounds rather, no wounds, and you need to generate wounds, right? That is what Festering Strike is for. Otherwise, the rest of your rotation is what you're pressing. Now, you'll notice I didn't say anything about Outbreak. That's because A-Bomb's applying the disease. You'll keep disease on your target for sure. And the Outbreak button is the way to do that, even in your burst window. And uh, if you do that, you're gonna keep your Necrotic Wounds high by spending wounds when they come. And you're gonna bump up your Gargoyle because you already got your set of globals out, which means the rest of these buttons can really just be Death Coil, Death Coil, Death Coil, Death Coil. And that's your burst window, right? Um, so we'll take a look at it real quick. You'll see how the wounds generate themselves. Let's drop the Raise A Bomb right here. I'm walking in, I Dark Transform. Festering Strike, you can see the wounds generate themselves. Apoc, Gargoyle, and now all of a sudden, Max Runic, Spend, Spend, Spend. But look at this. I don't have to press any Festers. Spend, Spend, Scourge, Scourge, Spend, Scourge. What, I haven't pressed a single one. Look at this. Spending, Spending, Spending. Spend it looks just a one, four. Look at the look at the uh, buttons highlighting. One, four, one, right? And that was my entire burst rotation. You can see tons of gargoyle, tons of magic of the dead, tons of clawing. Where's festering strike? One for the initial apoc. And that's what a burst rotation looks like for unholy. Exactly like that. If you've seen my stream at all, you've seen one shots galore until 
2,800 or beyond, right? So that is what a burst rotation should look like. So like I promised, sustain is part of this. What's different about sustain in the priorities? Nothing. The only thing that's different is that you're just waiting for those cooldowns to come back up. And depending on how they come up, because you have certain things that reduce the cooldowns, sometimes you'll wait. Like let's say Dark Transform and APOC are five seconds apart. Wait for Dark Transform to come up and then APOC and then Dark Transform just like that, or rather vice versa. So if your cooldowns are gonna come up similarly at the similar time, then one, you wait on one for the other. If they're not, you just use them as they come up to keep that pressure going because Unholy is different. Unholy always has damage. It's pretty remarkable because with wounds and with necrotic wounds and with all these sources of damage, if you press one cooldown on its own instead of with 15 other cooldowns, it still actually cranks, right? Otherwise, it's the exact same priority. Nothing changes. When you're about to be capped on Runic, you have to spend it so you don't overcap with Death Coil. Now that Death Coil does a ton of damage. And if you're about to... Um, Tap on wounds, you have to spend with Scourge Strike. But outside of your burst, you don't really have as many generators of wounds, which means all you have to do is the exact, this simple priority. I should put like a super note, like a, another timestamp for right here. The most important thing, spend all your wounds to zero and then reapply them, right? Because in PVP, nothing is ever perfect. Let's say you have three wounds and you use a Festering Strike and you get the three wound roll on that. Now you have six wounds, which generally isn't a problem. Six is the cap. So you could just start spending them if everything was perfect. Now you get rooted and you're running Scourge Strike or you get cloned even with Clawing Shadows. Let's say you're running Clawing. So you're like, ah, I could just spend it at a range. Nope, you got cloned. You cannot press Clawing Shadows in a clone. And your pet with Infected Claws applies three more wounds while you're in that clone. All three of them are wasted. Why did you need to get them to six? You had three wounds already, you could have spent them, but instead you press Festering Strike and now they're at six wounds and your Infected Claws, which does exist in almost every Unholy build, just applied three wasted wounds, right? There's no reason to cap out wounds. So instead, the Cardinal Rule, the Golden Rule, spend every single Festering Wound on a target before applying another one. Easy. So now you know the priority. Spend wounds to zero, then apply them. Death, but before you reapply them, you need to spend those death coils if you're about to be capped out on runic power. You know the burst rotation. And what changes? Based on the builds? For wounds? Well, I mean, you can take a guess. It's the exact same, pri same priority system, except because wounds give you fester might, you kind of put a little bit more edge on spending wounds to zero before spending death coil to zero, right? But with death coil, you put a little bit more edge on spending death coil runic power to zero before wounds to zero, right? And the disease build takes out a lot of the wounds interaction where it's like that important and you just have your rod on them. You'll check my other video for that. Uh, the one that I just created, two new builds for Unholy and Frost with the hyper rot build where uh, you effectively just keep your rod up and smile because <laughs> everybody's dying around you. Very fun. Um, but right, so that priority system is inherent to all Unholy builds and you just change whether or not you're focusing on Death Coil or focusing on Scourge Strike all your wounds away uh, based on which of these builds you're running. And eventually, uh, come Dragonflight, most packages will be able to get this Festermite Unholy Assault Death Rod. And Unholy Assault is a great button to add to this combo. Like, let's say if uh, I was running Unholy Assault as well. Remember how I did, this is so great, because this will answer all your questions. You're like, oh, great, cool. Thank you for that rotation guy, but you forgot, what about all these stuff, right? Festermite, Unholy Assault, here you go. Remember how in the opener of that build, in that burst rather, I used one Festering Strike to generate enough wounds for APOC. Replace that one Festering Strike with Unholy Assault. It will give you all the wounds and you'll press APOC and you'll do everything else exactly the same. Every other priority, every other button press, every other offensive cooldown, exactly the same, but replace the Festering Strike with Unholy Assault. Gives you the wounds. You, pl you spend them with APOC, just like you would have spent them from Festering Strike to APOC. You do everything else exactly the same. And as you're doing it, again, you keep that priority leaning on wound bursting instead of runic power spending because of Fester Might. Bopping all those wounds gives you a ton of strength and you are loving it. And that's Unholy 
Um, in a nutshell, for the priority system, uh, I hope that helped. Let's go on to the next section. Okay, so we're moving into the defensive cooldowns and survivability management of DK as a whole. This is not spec specific, so here you go. No need to skip to anything. The uh, main abilities here are Death Strike, Anti-Magic Shell, Icebound Fortitude, Lichborn, Blinding Sleet, now that they both have that. Very exciting. So let's talk about why for each one. Death Strike is your self-heal. It's a decent self-heal uh, when it's just pressed regularly. Uh, as a part of your rotation, but it is an insane self-heal when it is in response to a big burst window from the enemy team. Because you'll notice it heals you for 40% of all damage taken in the last five seconds with a minimum of 11%. So that's the minimum that you can heal with um, if you just use it regularly on cooldown, rather whenever you have runic power. But if you've been bursted and it heals you for 40% of the damage taken in that five second window, I mean, right now you could heal for 70, 80K easily. 70 or 80,000 easily right now in a burst window from the opponent. So you get down to 40K and then you slingshot back up. And this has immense synergy with Will of the Necropolis. Will of the Necropolis reduces damage taken below 30% health by a lot, but it does not count as a flat wall. Like let's say Astral Shift from Shaman that just takes away the damage done. For DKs, because it's part of the DK spec, it's supposed to synergize with us, and it does. This will show up on your healing done. Why is that? Why would it show up on your healing? Astral Shift doesn't. Neither does like an, a warrior wall. Because it accounts as absorbing the damage done. So the damage is done to you, and then it absorbs the amount that's below 30% health, which effectively counts as taking the damage and then healing it, which means the damage is taken which means it counts for the damage taken by Death Strike. So if you get chunked and you get lower and lower below that will of the Necropolis, it will soak that damage so you don't die. And then you can press Death Strike and top yourself right back to full. So Death Strike right now, an amazingly important button. Uh, it is why it is the only reason you would ever not fully drain runic power if you are kill target, right? So in the prior sections, we talked about burst rotation and sustain rotation. Well, you add in one little twist now that you've gotten this far in the guide, another tool to your toolkit. You say, okay, I've got the rotations. I know how to do the most damage, but am I kill target? If I am, anything that takes me to zero runic power is never going to be the move. So for like unholy, if you're trying to spam as much death glows as possible, but you're also kill target, you wouldn't drain all your runic power. You would move on to clawing when you're at about 30 or 40, and then you would spend clawings to get it back up to make sure that you can death strike at a moment's notice if you take a lot of damage, right? So death strike adds another wrinkle into your rotation because PVP is about staying alive so you can continue playing through the arena match, right? And that's Death Strike, a very, very big heal that if in the right hands can heal for an enormous amount. You just gotta know right at the end of their burst window when it's time to press that Death Strike before you die. Huge. Icebound Fortitude, let's go on with that. This is a wall on a two minute cooldown now that we have the talent for it. That's a two minute wall with a 30% damage reduction. But more importantly, it is a stun break, stun immunity. So when you get kidney shotted by a rogue and you're in a six second stun, you can press this button and you will get the wall, but you also get out of the stun and any future stuns guaranteeing you to live. Um, as a result, this is a two faceted defensive cooldown, right? You wanna use it if you're about to die in that kidney shot, you press IBF, you get out of the stun. At the beginning of the stun, because it's not like he can restun you, so you just get right out of it, and then you just start death striking, and that go is completely wasted. They can, uh, a rogue mage can't really kill a target that's immune to stuns, has a 30% wall, and can death strike to full, right? So. That's a really good tool. But let's say they have gone your teammate the entire game and thus you still have Icebound Fortitude up. And you see a rogue, say he's at 3% health and he cheap shots you to peel, right? He's like, I'm not trying to kill you. So you don't really wanna use your trinket and get out of it, but you realize you have Icebound Fortitude. So Icebound Fortitude isn't just a way to survive. Sometimes it's a way to win, right? And that's a, that's a pretty, core idea with DK defensives is that they can also be offensives, right? Because if you get out of that stun and kill the rogue, you've won the game. You have now won the game because you killed him, right? And as long as you guys don't get 2v3, you're probably going to win. So Icebound Fortitude, 
Um, very clear, if you're killed target and you're in a six second kidney and they pop a lot of offensive cooldowns, press it, get out of it, death strike. Um, but it also has that situation where you, let's say you get Hodge and your healer's cross CC so he can't dispel it, but the ret is just about to die, you can IBF and kill him. AMS is the exact same way, but instead of all damage, it's magical damage. But what's crazy about AMS, unlike IBF, it has to be pre-popped. You cannot get out of a Cyclone by pressing AMS. You cannot get out of a Polymorph by pressing AMS like you can get out of a Stun, right? But if you press it before the Polymorph lands, it immunes it. If you press it before the Clone lands, it immunes it. So what's the idea here? The same thing applies. If you're taking a lot of magic damage, if you're kill target, you press AMS and you absorb a lot of that magic damage. But if you've never been kill target and they're, they're just trying to kill your teammates and you see a window where you either need to peel for them or kill the enemy, you press AMS on an incoming CC. It lasts for a decent amount of time. It prevents all CCs during that window and you can either finish off a wounded mage, a wounded boomkin, or grip their next cast, stun them to make sure that they can't kill your partner. Because if you're in a clone and your partner's dying, there's nothing you can do. But if you AMS the clone and then stun the boomkin and your partner doesn't die, then you've used AMS in a good way. It's not always about your character, but also about what else is going on during the game. Lichborn is a final ability, not quite as two faceted, although it can do a lot of things. Um, it's not bimodal like that. In that when you press it, it does things. You don't need to kind of like worry that you're using it incorrectly because you use it in a fear, it immunes the fear. You use it in a mind control, it immunes the mind control. You use it in a succubus sleep from Warlock, it immunes that as well. It also provides a damage reduction from this talent right here and increases the duration of how it immunes all of those things. And it increases your leech to give you healing. And, and this is one crazy aspect that a lot, a lot of people know, I've talked about this before, but if you're new here, perfect time to say it. It makes you undead. Undead is not humanoid, it's undead. And certain crowd control effects in this game can only be used on humanoid targets. Polymorph is one of them. Hex is another. Rep is a third. So if a, if a crowd control effect says must be used on a humanoid target and you press Lichborn, making you not a humanoid target before the effects lands, it'll immune it. But it's not like the rest of this. Look at this, it says making you immune to charm, fear, and sleep. If you press it while you're in a fear, you get out of the fear and become immune to the fear. But with Polymorph, you have to press it before. Because it's not making you immune by the ability, it's making you immune by changing the type of thing that you are, by making you not a humanoid anymore. So to recap this very interesting, incredibly complex ability for a Polymorph, a Hex, a Repentance, something that requires a humanoid target, you have to use Lichborn before it lands. For a Fear, a Charm, or a Sleep, something that's named on the ability's toolkit itself, right? It's tooltip itself. You can press it in any of those CC effects and immune them. It also gives you a damage reduction, which is nice if you guys are panicking and you just need a last second off global damage reduction so you can try and stay alive while the Leech helps heal you just a little bit. You can also death coil yourself to heal yourself in Lichborn. And the macro for that looks exactly like this. Slash cast Lichborn, slash cast target equals me. Replace that with your name in brackets, death coil. That will heal yourself every time you press um, that macro again. You can just press it again. As long as you have runic power, you'll death coil yourself and heal yourself. Man, DK is cool, huh? So many cool effects. Finally. We have uh, two more abilities here. Chains of Ice, I wanted to talk about briefly. But Blinding Sleep. Blinding Sleep used to be only a Frost thing, now it's all DKs, and it's an incredible tool because it is, if you're familiar with DR, DR means a CC effect of the same type will be shorter than the first one. So let's say you stun somebody and stun them again, it'll be half duration. Blind is off that diminishing return, that DR category, as all of our other CC. We have stun, we have pet stun, we have remorseless winter stun, but none of those things are blinds. None of them are disorients, which means it's a five second AOE CC that does not DR. So anytime we're in trouble, we can use blind on a melee, blind on two melee together, grip them and blind them both and peel for our teammates, peel for us, blind, grip a lock to a warrior and blind both of them during their go to peel that. Blind a healer to try and finish off a DPS, right? Blind is situational. If anybody asks you, when do I use blind? You say, when the situation arises, right? Because 
there's no, it, the good thing about PVP and why it's so interesting and so fun to play is that there's no exact answer to any of these questions. So blinding sleet, very simply, when the situation arises. Okay, I'm, I'm about to die. I can see my health bar. I know I'm about to die. I'm looking directly at it. That's a situation that requires me to CC the enemy team. Grip the lock to the warrior, blind them both. Oh, their team has a guy who's 3% health on it. And I can see that using my eyeballs. I'm gonna blind their healer because now he cannot heal the player that's 3% health. And thus the 3% health player will go to 0% health and we will win. All right, situational usage. Chains of Ice is exactly the same way. Not as disruptive of, as blind, but it has no cooldown. If you need to kite, double melee, put them in a Chains of Ice and they will be 70% slower. If you don't want people to kite you, put them in a Chains of Ice and they will be 70% slow, slower. This is effectively another survivability utility button, even though it's spammable because you can use it when you're dying, you can use it when the enemy team is dying, just like blind. Whatever the situation, if you need to get away or you don't want them to get away, you can press chains. Or if you need to live or you don't want them to live, you can press blind. Pretty much hand in hand, one of them a cooldown, one of them spammable, but they work in similar ways. And that, my friends, is a little intro intro into rotation, uh, rotation of your defensives and uh, playing survivable. So hopefully that helps you get right back into the mindset of DK. And finally, I wanted to end things off with a really quick section. This video has been long enough, so I'm sure that's much appreciated from you guys. Just as some predictions of the comps um, going into Dragonflight, because people are asking now, we have to wait for the meta to develop, but what we do have is a history of this game. So people coming back to the game, we have the benefit of history to help them out, like what they might be looking for. So what does history say about DK comps? What are we traditionally very good with? Windwalker monks, warriors, fury or arms, demon hunters, havoc demon hunters. They have AOE damage, AOE stuns. They are survivable. They can rotate their defensives. My darkness or my zone, your darkness, that sort of thing. They're high mobility. They're high sustain. They ooze damage just like DKs. Warrior does similar stuff. It provides a mortal strike effect. Windwalker has an AOE go. What is DK really good at? Pulling people in to a pile so the leg, leg sweep hits all of them and an AOE go becomes stronger, right? So Windwalker, Warrior, Demon Hunter. Those are some of the melee. What casters is it traditionally very good with? Locks. Affliction Lock is a rotty version of it, but Destro is like a uh, pull them into a pile and do a burst go with Infernal down and Infernal stun and multiple bolts flying out with Havoc to bolt multiple people. Demo lock has also been very good, um, just as a rot with Unholy. You have pets and rots, they have pet and rot. Set up some Death Coil, Tyrant, Gargoyle setups, right? It's hard to CC all of that. It's so much sustain, very difficult to peel. So Aflock is the disease rot. Demo lock is the pet rot. Destro is the burst goes. You also have Shadow Priest. Shadow Priest has instant CC, stun silence on the healer. You guys both channel your damage into one target while off CCing the healer with all your instant CC effects that are very difficult to disrupt. You can cross CC because you have a stun, asphyxiate, they have a stun, psychic horror. They have a silence, you have a silence, right? Shadow Priest, and one more Do you might look out for, Boomkins, right? Boomkins, Traditionally are not quite as synergistic, but when they are, it's in a big way because your pillar of frost, this is like a frost, more of a frost thing, your pillar of frost combined with their beam means you could grip pe three people and stun them and then silence all three of them. Nobody really has an AOE silence except for exactly Boomkin. So if you've stunned all three targets and then you silence all three targets off of that, that's an off DR, right? Stun and silence, they're not the same DR, but it's so disruptive anyway because silence makes it so a lot of players can't cast anything and stun makes it so a lot of players can't cast anything. So effectively in that window where you stun them into silence them, they have to press every button, trinkets, walls, everything. Just do it again. Just do it again, right? So. Again, melee that you guys are going to be looking for, practice with, get ready for Dragonflight, Warrior, Windwalker, Demon Hunter, Casters, Locks for sure, Shadow Priest, Boomkin, 
right? And as the meta develops, we'll see if anything crazy comes out. I mean, Shadowlands Outlaw DK was good, but I can't recommend that in good conscience. I think it was a one-off thing. Ebola's been good exactly one time, but do I think that's going to be good again? That's Feral DK, Feral Druid DK. I don't know, Ellie DK? I don't know, right? So those are the, nah, throw them out for right now. We'll see if the meta develops in a way that makes one of those things incredible. But again, those three that I mentioned, those are the, for each melee and for caster, those are the big guys, the things you will be looking for based on, you know, maybe you tell your partner uh, that you generally queue with, hey, uh, I think this build might be kind of good. This comp might be kind of good going into Dragonflight. Maybe we should practice a little bit. And that, my friends, is your introduction, your survival guide in pre-patch, so to speak. I hope that it helped you get back into the game. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful time. And I'll see you guys in Dragonflight. Peace.